Well, dear friends, I invite you to turn with me to our scripture reading for today as it is found once again in the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you are using a maroon Bible, this can be found on page 983, page 983. Given Passion Week, we have been away from 1 Corinthians for a brief period of time. And we turn today to a fairly lengthy chapter that we have studied previously, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And if you have only come to our flock recently, you may want to go on our uh, website or our YouTube channel and go back and listen to some of the messages. Uh, Paul has been addressing uh, many different issues in the church at Corinth that are often uh, very applicable as well. Uh, to the Church of Jesus Christ today. And so we have entitled this series, Chiseling the Church at Corinth. Chiseling the Church at Corinth. Now friends, as we begin reading 1 Corinthians 7, uh, I ask you to pray with me that many of the, um, the studies that we've already engaged in will come back to our hearts and minds. There are many different practical topics relating to marriage and the family and the like that we have studied uh, previously. And I hope that uh, these will be brought back to your heart and mind uh, by the Holy Spirit. But I draw your special attention as we read verses 1 through 24. I draw your special attention to verses 17 through 24. As verses 17 through 24 will constitute our text for today. But again, keep your spiritual antenna up. Perhaps remember some things as uh, we have studied the first part of that passage previously together. 1 Corinthians 7 Beginning in verse 1, reading through verse 24, let us hear then the word of the Lord. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And now verses 17 through 24 constitute our text for today. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I laid down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. 
Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. <clears throat> dear congregation of Jesus Christ, the story is told of an old uh, Quaker who once put an advertisement in his local newspaper, and the advertisement said this. It said that he would give 40 acres of rich farmland to anyone who was perfectly satisfied with what they had. Well, no sooner had he put the ad in the paper than there was a knock on his door. The uh, Quaker opened the door. And he said, are thee perfectly satisfied with what thee hast? And the man standing at the door replied, yes, sir, I am. Well, then, replied the Quaker, why dost thee want this land? <laughs> why dost thee want this land? Now, friends, think about that. I share that, that illustration with you because is it not true that many times you and I are like that man who knocked on the door of the Quaker who had placed the advertisement? That is, we may verbally profess that we are perfectly content with our lot in life, satisfied with the situation in which God has placed us providentially in life. In fact, so much so that we might imagine ourselves saying with the sorely suffering patriarch Job at one of the most difficult periods of our life, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And maybe some of us can actually give that kind of testimony that God has granted us that kind of grace at a particular painful moment in our life. But friends, I would suspect that for the most part, if you and I were really honest with ourselves, and generally speaking, looked deep down inside, we'd have to confess that there are indeed times in our lives when we might profess perfect contentment or satisfaction with our lot in life, but that again, deep down inside, we wish that some things were different. We wish that some things could be changed. We wish that God perhaps would place us in a different circumstance or situation in life. Now, the reason I say that is because as I reflect back over some 40 years of pastoral experience, I've spoken young people to many, uh, many, many young person who was single and was desperately wishing that they were married. Interestingly enough, I have also spoken with any number of uh, married people <laughs> who confessed to me sort of in, in confidence that given the situation of their marriage or their family right now, they actually wish that they had stayed single. I've spoken with a number of white collar professionals who have said to me, you know, if they had to do it all over again, they wish that they would have pursued a, what they call a blue collar job where you could work from seven, eight or nine to five and just be home and, and done with it for the day. And I've also spoken with some so-called blue collar guys that say, oh, how they wish they could have pursued a white collar professional career and on and on it goes. Perhaps you can identify with some of those sentiments. Well, friends, when we consider these things, I suppose it is, is it any wonder then that the Apostle Paul declares in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, be that as it may, as we begin our, our focus on our text for today, again, look with me, please, at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 24. We find ourselves being challenged by the fact that just as was true for our brothers and sisters in the church at Corinth some 2,000 years ago, 
The same thing is true for each and every one of us who are Christians today, whether we are here, whether we are near, or whether we are far. And that similarity is this. Because Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that of utmost importance is our consistent keeping of the law and the commands of God. No matter what our personal, social, or economic standing or status may be. You and I need to pray that by the grace and mercy of God, by the person and power of His Holy Spirit, and through faith in the name of Jesus, you and I will ever increasingly and ever more earnestly seek to be content in our condition. To be content in our condition. Now, personally speaking, what does that mean? And practically speaking, how does such contentment manifest itself? Well, as we try to answer these and similar kinds of questions, we're going to be working our way through our text for today and consider, first of all, what I'm calling Paul's primary exhortation. Paul's primary exhortation. For example, look at verse 17 with me, if you would please. Paul says, nevertheless... Now, you may have a Bible version that translates that differently. You may have a Bible version, for example, that begins verse 17 by saying only or perhaps but. Uh, in the Greek, it's, it's two words. It's a, may, and it's, and it's a conjunction that ties in what Paul is about to say with what he has just previously said. Now, think of the significance of that. If you skim over those first 16 verses of 1 Corinthians 7, brothers and sisters, that we read a few moments ago, think about all the things that Paul had addressed. He had addressed being married. He had addressed being single, what we call the gift of singleness. He had addressed a widows. He had addressed um, being unequally yoked in a marriage, a believer with an unbeliever. He had addressed uh, matters of divorce and so on. And so you can, you can bring to your heart and mind all of those things that he has just spoken about and then understand better in verse 17. He goes, nevertheless, or but, or only, look with me, Nevertheless, each person, he's speaking to every single one of us, none of us is accepted, should live, the Greek literally says, or walk, the way you live, should live or walk as a believer, the word believer is not in the Greek, it's, but it's sort of implied in the context, should walk or live as a believer in whatever situation, again, another implied word, technically not in the original, in whatever situation, the Lord has assigned or apportioned or distributed to them just as God has called them. Now, friends, notice here that Paul is addressing what I'm calling a twofold calling. He is, first of all, addressing a spiritual calling. In fact, you can tell that by the verb uh, called in verse 17, where it says, just as God has called them. That's the perfect tense, which means it's referring to a one-time past action with an ongoing, enduring, continual effect. And so he's referring to that time when God in His sovereign grace and electing love called us from darkness into His marvelous light. He, called us, he caused us to be regenerated. He caused us to be born again. He gave us graciously the gift of saving faith in His Son. So he's talking about, first of all, a spiritual calling. But also, even though it's a little more choppy in some of the other translations where it might say, uh, live as God has called you uh, to live, something like that, he's talking about our, our situation or our vocation. What is our place in life? What is he calling us to do in life? What are you and I primarily preoccupied with in a personal, practical sense, day by day? And so he's talking here about a, a spiritual calling, and he's talking about a practical, or I'll say, a vocational or situational calling. And then he says, this is the rule, look with me at the text, diatasso, uh, diatasso is an order, it is a direction. It is a command. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Now, friends, just privately, quietly meditate on the import of that text. And then I want to ask you, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? I'm going to read it again just without comment. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Ponder that for a moment. How does it make you feel? When I first studied that, that portion of the text, and just kind of prayerfully meditated on it, I have to just confess, it made me feel a little trapped. Did it make you feel that way? Just let me see. You. Not if you felt at all like, wow, I'm stuck. Did anybody feel I'm stuck? Okay. 
Okay, a few of you, but well, most of you like this didn't affect you at all. It, some, thank you. It, it makes you feel like, well, God's got me here and I've got to stay here and it's a rule he's giving to me. I, I think I might be trapped. Not so, not so. That's not a correct interpretation and we're going to see that in just a moment. And so just leave that. I'm not going to explain why it doesn't mean that right now. We'll get to it. But for now, let's just take God at his word at face value, first blush. Just, just think what it said, all right? But now let's pair with that a commentary on that portion of the text that I found a little later on in this passage in my Reformation Study Bible notes. The Reformation Study Bible said, and this is profound, listen carefully, commentary on, our, on the words of our text. Dissatisfaction and complaint can be fatal spiritually. They reflect lack of confidence in God. I'm going to read it again. Dissatisfaction and complaint can be fatal spiritually. They reflect lack of confidence in God. Okay, meditate on that. And now I'm going to add the words of the great reformer John Calvin, commenting on verse 17. Here's what Calvin writes. He says, This calling, whatever it is, should hold us, as it were, under God's yoke, even where an individual feels his situation to be an unpleasant one. I'm going to read that again from Calvin. This calling, verse 17, whatever it is, should hold us, as it were, under God's yoke, even where an individual feels his situation to be an unpleasant one. End of quote. Now think about that. Friends, as I was meditating on the Reformation Study Bible's comment, on Calvin's comment, and my initial first blush interpretation of that text, you know what came to my mind? I thought of Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 10, question and answer 27, which I would like you to turn with me if you would care to turn. We're going to read it together. You don't have to turn, but if you're willing, page 876 in the back of our hymnals. Page 876, Heidelberg Catechism, one of the great confessions of the Reformed faith, not on a par with Scripture, but a faithful teaching tool for God's people dating back some 500 plus years. Page 876, Lord's Day 10, question 27 asks, directly related to verse 17, what do you understand by the providence of God? And let's read that answer together if you're there with me. Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which God upholds, as with His hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Thank you. And now again, with that in mind, I read verse 17. Nevertheless, as each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Being content in our condition and first of all, we understand Paul's primary exhortation, his primary exhortation. Well, friends, as our text continues, we're going to consider, secondly, being content in our condition and two practical examples, two practical examples. Look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 7 with me, if you would, please. Paul continues by saying, Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Now, let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> I think the guys are getting this one better than the comment I made on verse, on verse 17. Um, I have to be careful here now, too. Um, when, I, when I first read that, I'm like, well, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, this doesn't make any, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, how can you become uncircumcised, right? We're just going to leave it at that. But, I did a little research, and of all things, guys, of all things, I'm reading in the classic work by Josephus. Josephus uh, was a, a first century A.D. Jewish, Jewish historian, and he wrote this classic work, The Antiquities, The Antiquities of the Jews. And in there, I have the chapter and everything, Josephus writes this. Listen carefully, please. He says, The Jews had developed a surgical procedure which covered or concealed circumcision so that even in their flesh, they would appear to be Greeks. End of quote. 
And, and that was current in Paul's day. And so therefore, Paul writes, now you kind of understand it better, was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Why? Verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Notice this, keeping God's commands is what counts. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Now, as a commentary on that part of the text, and you would care to turn with me, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Go to the right, several pages, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, page uh, 1004, I think it is in the uh, Maroon Bible, or page 1005, uh, Galatians chapter uh, 5, verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, five verse 6. Yeah, page 1004, Galatians 5, verse 6. Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Remember, the utmost importance of keeping God's commands. The only thing that counts isn't circumcision or uncircumcision. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Jesus said, a new command I give you, John 13, 34 and 35, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Similarly, if you're in Galatians with me, flip over a page or two, please, to uh, Galatians 6, verse 15. Galatians 6, 15, same sentiment is conveyed. Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Again, living for God, having be, being recreated by God. All right, let's bring that information back to bear on the words of our text. He's given one example of, of kind of fleshing out this uh, being content in our condition. Uh, and, 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 he, and he goes on, though, in verse 20, and he says, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. He says that a second time already. He, he said it first in verse 17, and just a few verses later, he says it again. He's exhorting us to be content in our condition. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. But now he gives a second practical personal example. Verse 21, look with me please. Were you a slave? Were you a doulos, the Greek says. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Pay attention. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. Critical cross-reference. Remember I said when, when I first read verse 17, it kind of made it sound like God is trapping us into whatever situation or circumstance of life it is. And he goes, that's the rule. Just live there. That's where I put you. Just, just be content. That's where you got to stay. It's my rule for the church. But he's not trapping us. He says right here with his ses second example, even if you were called to Christ when you were a slave, uh, he wants you to be content. But however, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. If you can gain your freedom, do so. Can you think of a biblical example, New Testament times, where Paul really expounds upon that wanting a slave to be free? Somebody name the book of the Bible if you, if you know what I'm thinking of. Philemon. Yes, yes. Who, I don't even know who said it. Thank you. Okay, Philemon. Let's, let's go there. Let's go to the right several pages. I think it's page 1032 in your Maroon Bible, page 1032. It's a one-chapter book of the Bible. It kind of a lot of people don't pay a lot of attention to it. It's only about 25 verses or so. Page 1032 starts out, Paul, Philemon, verse 1, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and brother worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, skim over the next few verses, four and following. Paul goes on to thank God for Philemon. He thanks him for his prayers. He thanks him for his love for God's people. He thanks him for what a, a refreshing encouragement he had been to him. But then he brings up this man named Onesimus. Onesimus apparently was a slave of this man Philemon. He apparently had stolen from him, his, his master from Philemon, which according to Roman law, merited the death penalty. He had fled from Philemon he had apparently come to Paul and been used, God used Paul to bring, bring Onesimus to a saving faith in Christ. And so in verse 8, Paul says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you, what you should do, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, verse 10, 
that I appeal to you for my son, my spiritual son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that in any favor you would, so that in so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. You see the mysteries of the providence of God. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Verse 17. So if you consider me, Paul writes to Philemon, if you consider me a partner. Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. He says in our text, if you can get your freedom, do so. He has the opportunity to put that into practice with, with, uh, with Philemon and Onesimus. And so he writes that, uh, uh, that whole epistle uh, to, to Philemon. But now let's go back to our text in verse, uh, verse around, verse 20 again. Each person should remain in the situation they were in. They were called. But if you were a slave when you were called, don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. Verse 22, for the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who is free when called is Christ's slave, is Christ's doulos. And so again, whether you're slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised, that isn't the issue. And friends, that is why in Colossians chapter 3, if you want to go back there with me, go to the right again, several pages. Colossians chapter 3, page 1016, verse 11. Paul kind of pulls all that together in Colossians 3, verse 11. And he says, here, that is in Christ, in the Christian community, within the church of Jesus Christ, here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. But Christ is all and is in all. Friends, again, Paul is saying to, to all of us now, whether you're, what, he's using the slave illustration, I'm just using you and me for wherever we are in life. Wherever your situation is, whatever your circumstance is, know that God wants us to be content, but if you can improve your situation, if you feel that God is leading you into another situation, if he's trying to set you free, so to speak, from whatever it is you feel enslaved by or, or in chains by, that's okay. You can, you can pursue your freedom. You can pursue your freedom. But the bottom line, to quote a poster I saw many years ago, is that especially as Christians, God wants us to bloom where we are planted. He wants us to bloom where we are planted. He wants us to bloom where we are planted. No matter what our circumstance, no matter what our situation, no matter what our providential position in life may be, we have to live for Christ. We have to live for Christ. We have to live for Christ and allow Him to use us to bring God all the glory, to bring God all the glory. Paul speaks about this being content in our condition, and he gives us two practical examples of what that means for you and me. Well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7 one last time together. And again, under this theme of being content in our condition, Paul closes with a brief word of personal encouragement. A brief word of personal encouragement. Look at verse 23 with me, if you would, of 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, you were bought at a price. Does that ring any biblical bells with you? Friends, those words are verbatim from what we studied previously. Just flip back a page or two. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, when Paul was writing and we were studying about the, the seduction, the danger of sexual sin, and the fact that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, some of that may come back to some of us. He says that exact same thing in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings, of anthropon, of men, literally, the Greek says. Now, I've got an excellent footnote here in this study Bible on that phrase, uh, do not become slaves of human beings or slaves of men. And it says this, very insightful, listen carefully, please. Christians in all stations of life should realize that their ultimate allegiance is to Christ, who bought them with his own blood. I'm going to read that again. 
The essence of that, that part of verse 23 we just read is this. Christians in all stations of life should realize that their ultimate allegiance is to Christ who bought them with his own blood. And friends, that is why if you're taking notes, jot down Acts 5 verse 29. Because in Acts 5 verse 29, Peter and the other apostles said to the Sanhedrin, who had pulled them in to examine them about their ministry in the name of Jesus, Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles said to the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. And my dear brothers and sisters, that text is going to increasingly have weightiness and import for us as we go on in this increasingly godless culture and the persecution of Christians increases. And even in our daily workplace, we are going to be asked or requested or, not, or perhaps tried to be forced to do things that are in violation of God's law, in violation of God's law. And if you follow the headlines in the, in the Christian magazines or the news magazines today, you know we have many brothers and sisters who have lost their jobs, who have been sued, who have been taken to court, who have had all kinds of persecution against them simply for trying to obey God rather than men. And so take that verse to heart, tuck it away in your heart and mind, meditate upon it, we must obey God rather than men. And then, friends, the text concludes. Look with me, please, again at verse 23. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers and sisters, and now, <laughs> stay with me. The Greek here is really difficult to translate, and that's why the translations are all over the place. I'm just going to read it first, what the text says. Brothers and sisters, each person, as responsible to God, should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Now, you may have a translation that reads really different from that. And the reason is, is when it says each person should remain, there's no, there's no subject of the verb. You, you don't know what he's referring to. And so the, the, the King James reads literally, but kind of choppy. You know, it, it says something like, um, just as I could recall from the original and the way the tr King James goes, brothers and sisters, each person uh, should remain in what God called them, or in when God called them, something like that. So it's fleshed out a little bit, but the NIV, brothers and sisters, as we close, really unfortunately drops something very significant, and it is in most English translations. I'm going to draw that your attention to it in a second, because it's a key to the whole thing. Where the NIV says, each person as responsible to God, that's not in the original. I don't want to give the punchline away yet, but I'm going to give the punchline away. What you have in your translation, many of you, it says, and it's in the primary position in the Greek, in the grammar, and it's the whole punch to the whole thing. It's two words. Yes, with God. With God. That's the key to the whole verse 23. So I'm going to try to read it literally and yet making it clear. And yet making it clear. Here's how it could read literally. It's kind of my own RJK translation. Let each person in the situation or state, who has a New King James Version? Anybody have a New King James? Okay, okay, Mike. They italicize a word because there's no object of the verb. What's the word they italicize in the New King James? State, state exactly. NIV says situation. The New King James says state, okay, because they're trying to make sense of the, of the, of the text, all right? I'm going to read it again literally. Let each person in the situation or state they were in when God called them remain... Or abide, it's the word, Greek word meno, which is, Jesus uses in John 15, verse 5. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the import of that word. I'm going to start again. Let each person in the situation or state they were in when God called them, remain or abide with God. Remain or abide with God. The great 19th century, old Princeton, Reformed Presbyterian theologian uh, Charles Hodge says this on that portion of the text, and then we're done. Hodge says, communion with God secures our contentment. Communion with God secures our contentment. Communion with God secures our contentment. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. I have learned the secret, penned the Apostle Paul. I have learned the secret 
of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. O oh Lord our God, by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to your glory alone, enable and empower each and every one of us, we pray, each and every day, to be found increasingly content in our condition. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. 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 amen.